good to be back in this place to be with you guys. I love being here. I told y'all that um, Thursday night I got to come back after not being here for a while, but I'm super glad to be back in this house. I love to be here. I love the people here. I love the spirit of God that is in this place. It's always in this place, and I'm thankful for a crowd full of nothing but worshipers for Christ in this house. And that's what's important. We don't come here to be looked at. We don't come here to be listened to. We come here to worship the Lord. We come here to give the word, to sing the words, but we're all here for one sole purpose. Or we should be here for one sole purpose, and that's to worship God, to get the word out about the Lord. There's hurting people, there's sick people, there's people that need help. And that's exactly what we're here to be, uh, what we're here for is to be that help, to be that light into the darkness when they need help. There's people outside everywhere that need to know that your house here is shining for Jesus. Your house right here is shining and, and it's got the healing power. It's got the delivering power. It's got everything that Jesus wants us to be. And I'm thankful to be in this house. I love that, uh, that the Lord gave me a song like that. It had nothing to do with me. I'm going to be uh, honest and tell you that God woke me up. And he got me to my piano. He said to me, just go over there. And I'm like, Lord, I'm tired. What are you talking about? I know that if I go over there, I'm just going to be wasting my time. That's my flesh talking because I was extremely exhausted. I was tired and I needed to go to sleep. But he said, go back over to your computer, or your um, piano. I want you to go over there. I've got something for you. And it wasn't, it wasn't anything that I even expected. I thought I was going to say, Jesus, you know, just really just start to, tinker around there a little bit, but the Lord poured and spilled and kept pouring that into me. And he said, rise up and walk. He said, my people are so bound and they're so broken and everything that they've dealt with, their past, everything that they've gone through that they don't know how to get out of. They don't know how to stand back up. They don't know how to get back on their own two feet. They don't realize that, see, Satan had a plan, but God had a purpose. No matter what the enemy tries to do, God always has a purpose. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight is Satan had a plan. He thought he had a grand scheme, a grand plan. But God, God had a mighty purpose. He had a reason for everything. He knew from the very beginning what would happen, what could happen, what was going to happen. He knew the decisions that you would make. He knows you inside and out. He knows all things. There's nothing that we can hide from God. There's nothing that we can be hidden whatsoever. You can try to put on a, a persona, a fake facade, whatever you want to do. Come into the house, go out of the house like it's everyday thing, like you're going into your home and coming right back out. But God knows the true you. You cannot hide anything from the Lord. You cannot be fake with the Lord. No matter what you try to do, you can't be fake with God. And that's one thing right now. I pray all the time, Lord, don't ever let me be fake, no matter what. That may sound carnal, but I'm serious. Don't ever let me be fake about nothing. I want to know that I know that I'm praying to the one true king, and I'm being the person that God has called and wanted me to be. Amen? So that's what we need to try to do. So there's many different stories in the Bible that we can go back on where the enemy has tried to destroy God's children. So many from the very beginning when Adam and Eve was right there in the garden, the enemy had a plan to destroy all of humanity. He had a plan. He wanted to destroy us. He wanted to tell God, look, you've made these people, and I'm going to destroy them. They don't really love you. They're not going to live for you. But God had a plan. Amen. And he still has a plan. And I hope that at the end of this, you get the point that God is still in control. He still has a plan. And he can do anything that he wants to do if you will allow him to. Amen. So tonight we're going to turn to uh, Daniel chapter 3. It's a very familiar uh, scripture in the Bible. We have all heard it. If you have not, praise glory to God. That means that he gave the right message for you to hear it for the first time. But we're going to go to Daniel chapter 3 and 24. And this is... Uh, Give you a little bit of grounding really quick. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, he was building, he built a golden image, and they believed in other gods. They did not believe in the God that we serve. And so Nebuchadnezzar was building up this golden image, and he made a decree. Okay, you're going to find out that he made a decree that he wanted everyone, after the music was played, the trumpets were sounded, he wanted everyone to bow down to that golden image. 
but there were some children. Amen. There's a remnant. There is still a remnant that's going to stand for what's right, that's going to do what's right. We're going to find out about them. So in Daniel chapter 3, verse 24, we're going to start. <clears throat> and we're going to go on to, just to begin with, um, and then you can be seated after that, to verse 27. So 24 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, meaning astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men, three men bound into the midst of fire, into the middle of the fire? So they were bound, okay? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, meaning look. I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they put have no hurt. They have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth. So he's calling them back out. <laughs> he knows ain't nothing hurt them. Now he's, he's calling them. He's saying, come back out. I just want to talk to you for a minute. I want to see you for a minute. And he says, and come here, come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes, you hear what I'm saying? The princes, the governors, we're talking about the high people here, okay? The princes, the governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. The fire had no power over God's children. Satan had a plan, but God had a purpose, okay? It says that the fire had no power, nor was in hair of their head singed. <laughs> Not a hair. He knows every hair on our head. Not one was singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, God, to talk about you, Jesus, your goodness, your greatness, God. We thank you for the anointing, God, that's going to be in this house, God. I thank you for chains that are going to be broken in this house, God. I thank you for the people that are going to be stirred up in the gifts of God. I thank you for what you're about to do, God, in the word that you have put forth, God. I thank you for the spirit that's already in this house this evening, God. Lord, we give you all the honor and glory and praise, God. Touch these lips, God, of clay, God. Work through them, Lord Jesus. Let only your Holy Ghost, your spirit, Lord, be seen, be heard, God. Hide me behind the shadow of the Almighty. In Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In this time, we see that there is three Hebrew children, and they are, they love God. They pray to their God, and they tell Nebuchadnezzar, you know, because Nebuchadnezzar, he put that decree out, and he said, if anyone, he didn't care who they were. He was mean, nasty. He didn't care who you were. He said, if you did not bow down to that image, you were going to be thrown into the furnace of fire. So everybody was scared of that. They knew that their infinite fate was going to be that. There was nothing else but a fire. And can you imagine knowing that if you did something that made him upset, your body was going to be in complete flames? Anybody else in here besides me ever burnt your hand on a pot or got, uh, you know, hot water spilled on you? That's nothing like fire. I have a friend at church. His name is Joseph, and he has a brother, and uh, his name uh, is Eli or Elisha, and he has a paving company. Well, he was on his paver one day, and all of a sudden, it literally blew up in his face, blew up on fire. He was caught fire from head to toe. He was completely on fire, and he can tell you better than I can what fire would feel like, how bad it burns, how hot it is. Your flesh is melting off. There's nothing you can do about it. You're trying like everything that you can to get it off of you. I can't imagine what in the world it would be like in hell. Amen? That's what we need to do, too, is keep our family out of hell. But let me just tell you, so they were scared. They were worried. They knew that their fate was going to be that. All right? But let me just tell you something. These three Hebrew children, they had God rise up in them. And they said, I don't care. I don't even care if God does not deliver me out of this fiery furnace. Whether he does, 
or whether he does not deliver me out of it, I will not bow down to your God. I will not do what you ask me to do. What I'm going to do is serve my God, and I know that no matter what, God is going to see me through. So they knew that even if God didn't bring them out of that fire the way that, they, that, way that it happened, they were still going to go to heaven in glory and be with God. They saw the realness of it. They saw it to the end of eternity. So they said, okay, whatever it is, we're not going to bow down to your gods. We're just not going to do that. And so Nebuchadnezzar got told this. His people came and run. They ran to him. They wanted them in trouble. He said, hey, you got a couple of Hebrews over here. They're not going to bow down. They're not going to do what you want them to do. And you've made this decree. Don't forget you've made this decree. All right, they reminded him, you've made this decree that this must happen. Same thing that happened to Daniel. They, they reminded him. So Nebuchadnezzar was furious. It says his countenance even changed when he looked at them. He was furious, and he asked them. He, Nebuchadnezzar told the three Hebrew boys, he said, well, if you don't bow down, you do know. He's reminding them, you do know that you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. And they said, we sure do, but it doesn't matter. We are going to stand for what we believe in. We're going to stand firm in what we believe in. So he got angry, so angry, and he said, go ahead and make that furnace seven times the hotter. Seven times. And don't we know in the Bible that seven means what? Completion, perfection. That's God's number that we know of it. God had a purpose. Amen. So he threw them. He told his soldiers to go ahead and throw them with their coats on. They had their hats on, their turbans on. They had all this stuff on. They had extra, it says, and other things. So we don't know what those other things were, but they had other things with them. All three of them got thrown in there. Even the soldiers got burnt up. That was throwing them in there because it was that hot. But those that were looking on said, didn't we only throw three of them in that fire? They were in the middle of the fire, not in the back of it, not in the front of it. They were slap dab in the middle of that fire, and they didn't even get touched by the fire. He says, I see four. I see four. Didn't we only throw in three? But the fourth one was like of the Son of God. The Son of God was with them right there at that very moment. Satan may have a plan, but God has a purpose. Whatever you're going through, Satan may have a plan. You may wake up in the morning and you've got all hell coming against you. And I mean that about that kind of hell. You've got all kind of hell coming against you. Your kids are fighting. You and your husband are fighting. You don't know how you're going to pay this bill. You, you don't even know where you want to go to church. You don't know what you want to do for God. You don't know any of that. You're fighting about every little thing that you possibly could fight about. Think about this. From the very beginning, the enemy has tried to destroy creation, God's creation. He hates God. Don't you know that he's trying to destroy every little bit of who you are because of what you stand for? You have to be like those three Hebrew boys that say, no, 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 devil, no matter what, no matter what you try to, try to throw in front of my face, no matter what you try to do to me, no matter if you try to trip me up, I'm not going to stop serving God. I'm not going to stop doing what God told me to do. I'm not because God has a purpose for me. Let me tell you what, if those three Hebrew boys did not stand up and do what they did, we would not have that story right now to go back on and say, they did it. They were young. They stood the test of time. They stood in there and said, no, I'm not going to do that. And let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what God's purpose was. Listen to this. They served other gods. But at the end of that, listen to this. It says, and it's in 29, it says, therefore, I make a decree. Nebuchadnezzar's talking again. He says, therefore, I make a decree that every people, every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss, meaning against, if they speak anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. 
because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort, meaning this way. <laughs> Let me just tell you, look at that. <laughs> See, Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted to cut them down. But when he saw the power of God, because those boys, they stood their ground and they said, I'm going to serve God no matter if he lets me go or he pulls me out of it. Because they stood, the, they stood for what was right. Nebuchadnezzar told everyone, you better not talk about their God. He was even in fear of God. He didn't even serve God, but he even knew to seek out his salvation with fear and trembling. He knew that. He knew that. See, the enemy, he, he meant something bad for them boys. He did not want them to stand and do what they were supposed to do. Je Satan didn't even want Jesus to do what he did. He tormented. He tried to torment Jesus when he was in the Garden of the Gethsemane. He asked his, his friends, pray with me. Pray with me. And while he's over there praying, he's begging, he's crying. He's got great drops of blood dripping down his face. That's dripping down my Savior's face. And he goes back and he said, could you not just pray with me one hour? Don't you know that he was hurt? He was human and he was all God. Don't you know that he felt some hurt? He felt like he was betrayed a little bit. These are people he taught. These are people who walked with him that saw the miracles that he did. And they couldn't pray with him one hour. He went back and he prayed again. And he comes back and they were sleeping again. Couldn't you pray with me one hour? And he even asked his own father, Father, pass this cup from me three times. He asked that. But he said, but God, not my will. Yours be done. We have to get that way right here. Each and every one of us have to say, God, no matter where you take me, no matter what ministry you call me to, no matter what place, if it's down to the depths of the depths of it all, take me there. I'll do what you want me to do. I want your will to be done. God's will may not be for you to be in a certain place at a certain time. You've got to listen for the Lord. Quit trying to be this or trying to be that or trying to be here or trying to be there. I'm telling you, I can say this because I'm in a different place. Amen. But even in my own church, you've got people sometimes, they'll try to do certain things, and they're not called for that right now. They're not called for that in that moment. And sometimes we can get ahead of God, and that will hurt you. Believe it or not, that will hurt you. You have to be in the will of God, no matter what he calls you for. Be in his will. Let me tell you firsthand, I was one that was out of God's will for a long time. I was lost. I was a broken person, an unhappy person. There was no joy in my life. Joy might have been a funny or a comical video here and there, but that's not true joy. True joy comes when you can be at the lowest of low and you can still lift your hands and praise God for no matter what's going on. That's true joy. And let me tell you, God has a purpose for each and every one of you. God spoke to me about two different things. He said that we need to start stirring up the gifts that God has given you. God has a something for each and every one of you. It's not the same. We can't compare ourselves to other people. We need to start being like those racehorses and put blinders on and stop comparing our life to somebody else. You know why the horse wins? I, I found out. The reason why the horses do such a good job when they're running their race is because they've got blinders on. They don't compare themselves to the, per the, to the horse next to them. They can, co they can only focus on one thing, and that's to go forward. We need to do the exact same thing. Put those blinders on and spiritually move forward in God. He has something directly for each and every one of you. But let me just tell you, I don't know if it's up here. Let me grab it. It's over here with her. I didn't have this up here. But I just wanted to show you something that God has for us. This is red, but I promise I won't spill it. Okay. <laughs> I might need somebody to help me open this, though, because I can't open this very well. You want to open it for me? I'll try. I'm excited. I tried it earlier, and I couldn't even open it, y'all. Bless couldn't get it. All right, but I want y'all to see this. This is you. Okay? Oh, you see I tried it earlier. I told the truth. See that? This is you. 
you're a vessel. And guess what? You're an empty vessel. You're totally empty. You're a shell. You're an empty vessel, okay? But when you give your life to God, when you surrender totally to him, you're saved, you're sanctified, but now he's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost, all right? Hold on a second. Sorry, I just put it all in there. My husband drank some. He's bad. But now you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you think that's all he has for you? which is plenty enough. The Holy Ghost is plenty enough. We need it today to get through today. If you think for one moment you're going to get through this life without the Holy Ghost living inside of you, and I don't mean you just come up here and throw in some hands around, no. I mean the Holy Ghost checks you when you're going about to say something wrong. The Holy Ghost tells you when you're about to be mean to somebody. The Holy Ghost checks you when you've got an attitude. The Holy Ghost checks you when you're about to really want to steal something for a second and then put it back later after you chewed half of it. No. The Holy Ghost is going to tell you what to do, when to do it, what not to do, how to do it, all of that. Listen, I've seen people do it straight up. I've seen people chew half a piece of gum and put it back in the wrapper. I'm not kidding. But let me just, then that's gross. But seriously, let's get, get back to it. But so you're filled with the Holy Ghost. All right, but God has more for you if you want it. He has something for you. So he gives you, you know, your spiritual gifts. Your spiritual gifts could be singing. It could be preaching. Your spiritual gift can be teaching the word. Your spiritual gift can be praying. Let me tell you something. A prayer warrior is the best kind of spiritual gift to have. I don't know if anybody's told you that, but it is. We need more prayer warriors that are sold out to Jesus Christ than anything else because prayer is what shakes heaven. Amen? But so you've got these spiritual gifts, and, you know, if you just, you know, you've got the Holy Ghost, and that's amazing. That's great. You've got these spiritual gifts, but if you don't use them, you don't exercise them, you don't work and and do and move in the Holy Ghost in your spiritual gifts that God has given you and the elders have laid their hands upon you and they have given you those spiritual gifts, guess what they're going to do? They're going to just sit here and settle at the bottom. I mean, you see the color there. Everybody knows you're a singer, right? Everybody knows you're a drummer. Everybody knows you can teach, but you decide not to. Mm Mm-mm. God's going to give that to somebody else if you ain't careful. He can. He will use somebody else. He will equip somebody else's fingers to play that piano when you used to. He will do that because he will use somebody that's willing to step up and be used by God. Amen? What the devil meant as bad, God will turn out for his good, though. Watch this. But see, we have to put our hands to work. We have to start moving something. When we start putting our hands to work and we stir up those spiritual gifts, we stir them up and we let God use us and we keep using what God has given us, God begins to turn that up. And every single time that you exercise that gift, you get deeper in that word, you keep praying, you keep doing what you're doing, God is going to do this right here. You're going to be so full of the word. You're going to be so full of God. You're going to have every gift that he has stirred up in you. You no longer have to put on that cloak like the blind beggar man. You ain't got to wear that anymore. You can put pure out, take it off. Take off that cloak that used to define who you were. Let me tell you something. The enemy... Just like those that are drug addicted, those that are prostitutes, those that used to, she said she used to be a dealer. Let me tell you something. God can take anyone, turn them totally around, and use them for God's glory. The enemy had a plan, but God has a mighty God, mighty good purpose. Amen? Let me tell you what the Bible says. It gives me, oh, and let me tell you something else I forgot to tell you. About Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, something that really got me. I've known for a long time that their names were changed. Listen, you got people around you, maybe in your family or your friends that you used to, you know, claim as friends. They're going to try to change your name. They're going to try to tell you that you ain't who that is. I know who you really are. They're going to try to change your name for you just like they did in Babylon. They named them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Isn't it sad that we know them as that? That's what we call them. We don't call them their given names. They were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. People will try to change your name, but you got to step on over that. You can't let them change your name. You've got to know who you are in God. God has called you for a purpose. God has called you. It's up to you. Are you going to step into your calling? 
or are you going to back up from it? And I'm telling you right now, it can be scary, but the Lord tells us to fear not. He will equip each and every single person for their purpose. He knows what we need and what, what the church needs. You all are here for a purpose. I have seen this church grow so big, and there's a reason. God's got a purpose. He has his own plan. The enemy may have had a plan for a while to shake y'all, to sift you like wheat, but there's a reason why some wheat got pulled out, or some, not wheat, but, hmm, I was going to say weeds, but I don't, yep, weeds got pulled out. There's a reason. It chokes out the wheat. It chokes out the good stuff. It chokes out the fruit. I can tell you that from experience in a spiritual way and the real way. I have plants at home, and I ain't weeded in a while. Can you imagine what my plants look like? They done. I need to go ahead and pull them, pick them, and, and pluck them and all that stuff. I don't even know what you call it, pruning, whatever. But I need to prune them up. If you do not prune certain things out of your life, you will be choked out by it. You're going to be totally choked out. You're going to lose what God has intended for you. Can you get it back? Absolutely. Come back to the cross. If you have stepped back, if you've taken a back seat to what God has called you to do, you need to come back home to it. God is depending on you. He does need us. He, that's why he equipped you with it. Yes, he can do it on his own, but he called you for it. We need to stand up and be those soldiers, those mighty soldiers in God's army. Listen, the, the world has already got most of our children, our teenagers, We've got to rise up and stand up against that and stand firm in what we believe. We cannot waver anymore or be lukewarm or straddle the fence anymore. Listen, it's not time to do that. Hell is really, really hot, just like that fiery furnace. Hell is hot, and it's not getting any colder, right? Even the rich man told Abraham, send Lazarus down to put water on the tip of his finger just to touch my tongue. He was that hot, and he said he couldn't do it. There's a barrier there. He can't do it. Now is not the time to step back from your calling. Now is not the time to tell God, I'm tired. Do something else with me. Maybe he does have something else for you, but I'm telling you one thing is this. Always ask God for his will and wait. That's the most important part of it. If you do not wait, you're going to go ahead of God. There's been times where I could have left where I'm at so many times. We've been there almost seven years, and I love my church and my pastor so much. He will tell you, I, I have a love, a deep love for my pastor. But I have been hurt so bad, not by my pastor, but I've been hurt to the point where I was ready to give up. I've called my cousin a couple of times. You're going to have to pray me through. You're going to have to help me because people had changed my name. They changed my name. But let me tell you what, <laughs> I changed it back. God touched me and he helped me through prayer and we changed it back. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not giving up my race. I've done come too far. Like that song said, I've done come too far to give up now. You've done come too far to give up now. There's nothing on earth worth going to hell for. There's nothing on this earth to make you stop. Nothing. There's so many other things that we can get involved with, but the best thing in the world for us is to get involved with an active church, to get involved with the Lord. If you're, not, if you're not assembling yourselves with people of faith, I promise you, you will become who you are hanging out with. I promise you, you will start doing what they do, acting what, like they act, because you're going to start to become a little easy going with things. I can let up a little on this, and I can let up a little on that. It will happen. You no longer will stand firm like those three Hebrew boys with what they did. And when the time comes when you've got to stand firm in your faith or get your head cut off or whatever, you, you probably, you're probably going to get your head cut off anyways and then denounce Jesus. Be careful where you're at. Where's your soul right now? Are you strong in the Lord? You've got the Holy Ghost so strong that you can stand in the face of a soldier with black mask on and everything else, and they tell you to denounce Jesus or you get your head cut off? Are you going to be able to do it? Are you going to be able to see your child standing next to you, your grandchild standing next to you, and they threaten to do that? Are you going to be able to have that kind of strength? Do you've got that kind of, 
Do you have the Holy Ghost really living within you where you can face them and say, I will not denounce Jesus Christ. I will not bow down to your God. How many of us can do that today? How many? Think about it. Is it real with you right now? We went to a, a warrior fest, I think it was two years ago, right? Two years ago. And it was amazing. We had a great time with our youth kids. I really recommend it for you guys. If y'all can go, it's in Tennessee and Cleveland. And it's with Perry Stone's church. It's really great. It's called Warrior Fest. But we went up there. And while we were there, they had a bus. And this bus was all about martyrs. You had to go inside. If you were below the age of 18, you had to have an adult with you that consented that you can see these pictures. Um, and if you were above 18, you of course, you could go in and make your decision for yourself. And the reason being these pictures were so incredibly graphic, it was heartbreaking. People are dying everywhere. In America, too. Don't think it ain't here. It is here. <laughs> it is here. You just don't see it yet. It's happening in places that you wouldn't even think, in ways that you wouldn't think. It's right under your nose. People are dying everywhere for the name's sake of Jesus. So we went inside, inside of this bus. There's all these pictures and these people, and there's videos. These people are crazy enough to video what they're doing, but there's even videos of them talking to these people and telling them, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And they're crying, and they're begging, please don't hurt my child. Please don't do this. Just kill me. Just take me. Please don't. But they do it to every single one of them. Of course, they do the kids first. They want the parent to be in agony. The enemy has a plan, but God has a purpose. We don't understand certain things that we have to go through, and that does happen. The enemy is running rampant, but God has a purpose. There is still a remnant. God, ha God is so much bigger than the enemy. We can pray that mess away. We can do that. We can. We've got to get back to prayer. There's, prayer is not as strong as it used to be. Y'all know that, right? People are not praying. They're not on their knees like they should be. We have to start praying. It is going to knock on the windows of heaven. And that blessing is going to be poured out. But if we're not in that place where we can stand in front of people and say, I believe in Jesus Christ no matter what you put in front of me, no matter what you threaten me with, we're in a very dangerous place. If you can't go in a big, huge place and pray over your meal, you're in a dangerous spot. If you're choosing other things before the relationship with you and Jesus Christ, you're in a very dangerous place. If that phone takes more time than your prayer life or your talk with Jesus or your worship with the Lord, you're in a dangerous place. There's nothing that God can't do, but you have to give your life over to him for him to completely restore and do what he wants to do in your life. He can turn a prostitute into a prophetess, right? He can turn a demonic influenced person into the drummer on the praise team. He can turn a beggar on a street to the one who pays this church off. He can do that. He can do anything. That's another thing, too. We've got to be willing to reach those that nobody wants to touch. No one. How are we going to react? My pastor, he showed a, he showed a video today of this man. We, we don't know if he was dressed up on purpose or not, but this man was acting very, very drunk very much so, but they handed him a mic because he said he wanted to sing. He said he wanted to sing for the Lord. He wanted to sing a godly song. That man started to sing, and he sang amazingly, and when he started to sing, he no longer had that drunk way about him at all. He straightened totally out. He was not wavering back and forth. He was able to walk straight, talk straight, everything. There is nothing too big for God. There is no one that's unreachable for God. It's up to us to go talk to them. It's up to us to invite them. It's up to us to tell them about Jesus, tell them what God has for them. There is nothing too big for God. He's using each and every one of you for a purpose. 
He has something for you, even if it's just witnessing and saying, come to church with me. Come to church with me. Talk to your family members that you know are going straight to hell if they do not get saved. Guess what everybody is if they don't get saved? Not just the ones you think. They may be saved and you don't know it. That's why we shouldn't judge. But here's the truth. If people are not saved and you know they don't live a godly life, Reach out to them. If they get mad, keep praying for them. Do your duty. God has called you to it. If you don't, who will? If you don't pray for yours, who is going to do that? They don't know them. You know them. You know that person. You know where they live. You know their lifestyle. I pray for my brothers every day. I'm still waiting. But guess what? No matter what, I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to wait on the Lord because I know what his word says. It, whatever you ask, he will give it. We're asking for God's will. He's going to give that. It is God's will for us to succeed. It is God's will for us to love him. It is God's will for us to be delivered. It is God's will for us to be set free. It is God's will for us to work for him. So I know it's God's will for my brothers to be delivered. So guess what? That, that promise, it's coming. It's on its way. Do not give up in what you're praying for. Stand firm in what you know to be true. Stand firm in the truth. Like those three Hebrew boys, they stood firm in their answer. They didn't waver. They didn't think about it for a few minutes. They said no. I'm not bowing down to that. The enemy can throw you different thoughts, different ways of religion, all of that stuff. Religion's religion. All you need is Jesus. That's it. No religion. You just need Jesus and his word, a relationship with him. Don't stand for anything else. Stand for Jesus Christ and his word, and he will reveal everything that you need to do, everything you need to know in him. He will reveal that to you. Just stand firm in what God wants you to do. Listen to him and get his word out there to other people. And don't waver. Stand firm in his word, Pastor. Amen. I was just thinking as she was, I'm going to go ahead and close. I'm not going to preach to you because that would just take us into the round two. But I was th- sitting there thinking about the woman that uh, was bowed together for 18 years and couldn't know why I straightened herself up. You know what the Bible said there? It said she had a spirit of infirmity. A lot of times we look at, okay, she just had a bad back, so she was doubled over. But the Bible actually said she had a spirit of infirmity. And uh, sometimes we, just in light of what she was saying there, the enemy has a plan to keep you bowed over. But God, when he walked into the sanctuary, he saw her, Brother Benefield, doubled over in this regard, in the, in the house of the Lord of all places. If you can't get help in church, you're in bad shape. But right there in the house of the Lord, the Lord saw her, and he looked at her in that condition, and he straightened her up and done in her what nobody else could do. Here she'd come into the house of God. Nobody else had the answer, but he had the answer. And I want you to know, just like she said tonight, the, de- the enemy may have a plan to try to destroy you. He- he'll try to get you thinking, I'll be doubled over like this the rest of my life. But on the authority of the word of God, his name, his blood, I claim it. Say, no, you're not going to be like that forever. I believe if you want to be healed, you'll be healed. If you want to be saved, you'll be saved. If you want to be straightened up, you'll be straightened up. And that's exactly what he did to her. So stand to your feet, if you will, tonight. We're going to get ready and give you an opportunity to pray and seek the Lord. Always give folks an opportunity. Thursday night, I believe it was, I preached and I mentioned to the church that I've always been of the mind to give people an opportunity to pray. So you know what? You don't have to pray. That's between you and God. But I just want you to know that if right now that you were to go out and meet in in eternity, meet the Lord, you're either ready or you're not ready. So you can play games, play church, or you can really get serious with God. But in the end of this thing, when you start realizing just how much the value of everyday life is, how short that life is, you'll stop playing games with God. you get serious. He's got a plan to destroy your family, your marriage, your job, and everything else. But you say, no, in Jesus' name, I refuse it. I'm going to trust the Lord. He's going to make a way. Brother John's going to come play something for us tonight. And I want you to take a few minutes and give some consideration to some of the things that Sister Amanda talked about. Tonight she's talked about us obeying the Lord and the call God's put in our life. 
You may stand there tonight and say, well, Pastor Myers, I feel like maybe God may use me to sing, preach, teach, maybe one day be a foreign missionary, or I just want to be a help to the church, or I feel like I I need to grow in God. I want to give you the opportunity tonight to come before the Lord and say, you know what, Lord? I realize that if I don't do what the Word of God said and stir up the gift of God that's in me, all that goodness is going to settle down like sediments at the bottom of a lake. I'm going to become empty. I'm going to become dry. And you know how you stir up the gift of God that's in you? You get down on the altar and you you shed tears before the Lord. You begin to pray and talk to God and say, Lord, I don't want to stay right here. I've got to come out of the place that I'm at. And I need your strength and I need your encouragement. If you're not praying, I want you to find somebody and help them pray in an altar tonight. And just say, God, we confess our faults before you. We realize, God, that there's something you want us to do, but I can't do if I'm stuck right here. We just seek the Lord tonight. If you're not seeking the Lord, grab a hold of somebody else with their hand. Help somebody pray tonight asking the Lord to have his way.